Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everybody. And uh, the topic of tonight is fake news. In plan success is 98%. Yeah, successful. Uh, we're going to get right into it. But I'm going to do a short pause. I want to show you something. So Bay Lab and Catapult are working on a joint, I'd say, collaboration. We are basically donating um, per every 20 boxes that you order or yes, of our custom logo, Breast Cancer Cure. So I just put this out there. I think this is a great cause. I think dentistry itself has to start taking up these social causes. And I'm so proud of working with Bay Lab. So we love the mess. They're level three. They're already in our practices. And uh, that's my pitch. Here we go. So let's get to implant success, 98%. Okay, that's our first point that is gonna be shown to be purely false. So when I start to look at these kind of situations, when I have implant emergencies in my practice, I immediately know I'm not gonna have a good morning or a good afternoon. And we'll get into some of the issues with implants, but all I can tell you is, is we see this way too often. Implants are at less risk than natural teeth in regards to gum disease. I have heard this so many times. Oh, you want to take out that tooth, Mrs. Jones, because implants are far more successful. Are they really? And I think we're going to disprove a bunch of what I call myths tonight. Maintenance. Is maintenance really just br brushing, flossing, and rinsing? Is that pure maintenance around every implant patient? Or what about higher risk patients? And what is a higher risk implant patient? So let's start with myth number one. Implant success is 98%. Hmm, who says this? And you know, what's interesting is your patients come in and where are they learning about this? They're learning about it on the web. So implants, Dr. Graham, they're 98% successful. And I, when I look up and I go to WebMD, that's how I did. I prepped for the course. And you start to look at this stuff. I mean, this is the stuff that puts dentists, I think, in really challenging positions. And especially for those who really believe this. Because implants can last a lifetime. Of course, they can last a lifetime but it can also last a lifetime with issues. 98%, we're gonna get into what is implant success. Because when you define success, you could look at a variety of different ways to define it. And I think the simplest way is really from this study. So in this study in 2013, talking about success, they brought up four key points. Implants should not be mobile, of course. They should be absence of peri-implant radiolucency, okay. They should have an adequate width of attached gingiva, which I absolutely agree, and there should be no infection, okay. Is that the definition of implant success? Well, let's go to Carl Misch, because I think Carl Misch's definition of success is far more in depth. And here's what it shows. As you look at the first icon of success, it says no pain, okay, no tenderness, no mobility, less than two millimeter, two millimeters of radiographic bone loss. So he's already saying you can be successful with two millimeters of bone loss and no exudate. Well, what about satisfactory survival. Well, now you have two to four millimeters of bone loss. What about compromised survival? Well, they may have sensitivity to function, still no mobility. You could have radiographic bone loss greater than four millimeters, but less than half of the implant body. You could have probing depths greater than seven millimeters and you could have exudate. Okay. How many of those patients have you seen? Now, 
you can turn that successful. I call those patients, yes, they're integrated, but man, are we dealing with problems with these patients. Now, failure, when you look at failure, now you're dealing with mobility, which we know you can't have, bone loss greater than half, uncontrolled exudate, or they're just no longer in the mouth. So when you look at this and you really look at success and you look at it optimum, satisfactory, or compromised, how many of these are we seeing? We're seeing all three of those, including number four. I don't think so. I just don't think implants, by definition of what I'm looking at here, are 98% successful in optimal health. I think, as you will see in this program, it's far lower, far lower. So this will lead me to myth number two. And in myth number two, implants are at less risk than natural teeth in regards to gum disease. Okay, well, I'm just going to tell you that's a myth. So when I look at the Journal of Periodontology, and I use this as a reference for a lot of my courses on implants, this article specifically was a workshop on peri-implant mucositis. Now I'm gonna to get to clinical cases. I'm setting the backdrop. So peri-implant mucositis, which has no bone loss, is caused by biofilm accumulation, which is like traditional uh, periodontal issues, periodontal disease. And this accumulation will disrupt the host microbe homeostasis, just like periodontal disease. But this is at the implant mucosa interface. And so what peri-implant mucositis ultimately is, it's an inflammatory lesion. And it's important because it's considered a precursor for peri-implantitis, and that's a quiz question. So peri-implantitis just doesn't come out of nowhere. Peri-implant mucositis is the precursor. Now, as we get a little bit more into the study, biofilm-induced peri-implant mucositis is reversible. And it's far easier to reverse that than peri-implantitis. Now in this study, it showed that you could reverse the clinical signs of inflammation really three weeks or a little bit longer. So this was Salvi studies. And what he did was he really stopped patients brushing their teeth for three weeks. And this is, this is key. What he noted was plaque accumulation was greater around natural teeth. So you have greater plaque accumulation around natural teeth, but the implants had far greater gingival inflammation. So it takes a lot less plaque to create perimucositis. That's the bottom line. So I wanna be clear here, teeth get a lot of plaque, a lot of times it can lead to gingivitis as early stage. Paramucositis doesn't need that much plaque, but it is from plaque accumulation. And again, the hemidesmosomal attachment to an implant is why just a little bit of plaque accumulation can lead to trouble. Now in Meyer's study, he compared the biologic response during experimental gingivitis and peri-implant mucositis with those patients over 70, which is typically what I teach on geriatric patients. So we compare gingivitis to peri-implant mucositis. And again, there was less biofilm accumulation at the implant sites, yet the peri-implant mucosa had a lot more bleeding compared to the patient's natural gingival tissues around their teeth. So now you have younger patients by Salvi, older patients by Meyer. This is not an age-related issue. Implants are really far more accessible with far less plaque to perimucositis than natural teeth are to gingivitis. So how long does it take to turn it around? So Salvi and Meyer said basically three weeks, maybe longer. Other studies showed it can take up to 10 weeks. 
And all of these studies were evaluating the curricular fluid samples of interleukin 1b. So what they did was they measured interleukin 1b and they were just trying to get it back to pre-experimental values because it's an inflammatory marker. So when you look at Costa's study, this was a longitudinal study over time and patients diagnosed with peri-implant mucositis and those with a lack of adherent peri-implant therapy had a higher incidence of peri-implantitis at five years. So what does this mean? If you're not taking care of your teeth, okay, and you are getting peri-mucositis, peri-implant mucositis, okay, and you are not following strict protocols, you have a high incidence of developing peri-implantitis at five years. So do you consider that successful? Implantology, I'm questioning 98%. And one of our last studies I'll bring up is that there were 218 patients with almost a thousand implants in function for up to 14 years. Lower plaque scores were significantly associated, okay, with the presence of periimplantitis, which means, and I shouldn't say lower plaque scores, that you had plaque scores, I'm sorry, and they were significantly associated mis miscommunication with periimplantitis. Okay, so we get it. You don't need a lot of plaque to cause perimucositis, but in these patients, it showed plaque scores absolutely led to the problem. So plaque is the problem. Lastly, Dirk study showed that in five to 10 years of an implant placement, almost one in four will develop periimplantitis. One in two will develop perimucositis. Now you think about that compared to natural teeth. And that's the beginning of tonight. So then I'm gonna ask you a question. If we know the potential issues after implants are delivered, why not develop protocols prior to and at delivery? So these are the primary factors in the pathogenesis of peri-implant disease, and they can lead to implant failure. Obviously, the presence of active periodontal disease and inadequate oral hygiene are first and second. Not for tonight's lecture, but from Wilson's study over 10 years ago, we know what excess cement left can actually do and how two, three years later, you will start to see that periimplantitis develop, not initially. You could have faulty restorations, incomplete seating, open margins. You could have poorly positioned implants. These all lead to problems. You could have excessive occlusal forces. And I've seen this in my own practice where patients are bruxing and clenching and they are destroying their implants. And then you could have systemic issues such as diabetes or bisphosphonate therapy. And lastly, smoking and drug use. These can all lead to implant issues. But tonight, we're going to talk about implants in the presence of active periodontal disease and inadequate oral hygiene versus adequate oral hygiene. So those are the two issues I want to tackle tonight. So what does the literature show in regards to placing implants in the mouths of patients with the history of periodontal disease? Dentists are doing it all, all day long. So you could have a patient with fives and sixes on the upper right, fives and sixes on the lower right, and number 19 needed an implant. So what happens if you're placing an implant in those patients or with patients with really a severe periodontal disease history. Well, in 1995, Mabelli did the classic study. And his research was really to evaluate the bacteria or the microbiota of osseointegrated implants with a history of periodontal disease. And the patients of this study who had a high incidence of periodontal disease, not treated well, had a high peri-implant prevalence of anaerobic 
pathogens. Well, those are the same ones that are creating periodontal disease. And now they're going to be creating the same problems around implants. And as soon as three to six months after exposure of the implants to the oral environment, back in 95, you'd place it, you'd bury it. You'd wait four or six months, take an impression. Some of you weren't even born then. And then three to six months later, in a mouthful of periopathogens, you could predict failure. Bone loss occurred in the same study around the implants in patients with a history of aggressive perio more often than patients even with chronic perio or healthy patients periodontally. Now, what I'm going to show you in a few slides is that the bugs are different in aggressive perio than chronic perio than healthy. So you have different bugs and those different bugs can make implants more susceptible. An additional purpose of the study was to identify those bugs that were causing the implant issues. And those bugs included AA, PG, PI, Fusobacterium, C. rectus, and spirochetes. Now, going back to the Sokransky days of red and orange complexes, and those of you who don't understand red and orange complexes, those are specific biofilms in their own complexes, how I describe it. The red complex likes to hang out together. The orange hang out together. But cumulatively, these are the bad bugs. So when you do a DNA test, as I did on this patient years ago, what are the chances of this patient having a successful implant place? If you look at the high-risk pathogens, he's high in AA, all three of the red, and all five of the orange pathogens, all five. So if you would place an implant in this patient's mouth, it would fail. It would fail. So number one takeaway tonight is you got to get this periodontal disease under control before you even start thinking about placing implants. Now, when you look at this, and this is the complexity of bugs, perio bugs. On the top one, it's periodontitis with a slow to moderate rate. Those bugs are different than a progression of rapid rate versus refractory. And where do we see the most typical bugs in peri-implantitis are these same bugs in what we call aggressive perio. So if you do a DNA test, and we do a lot of DNA testing in our practice when we're treating moderate to severe perio, you could start to predict what you have to get under control and how are you going to maintain this long term becomes the second big issue because this patient is predisposed to these bugs. So in Greenstein's article in 1997, I can't believe it's 1997, he basically said that these bugs are indigenous in our mouths, the good bugs and the bad bugs. And it's all about the balance point for health. And I would say this is the summary of the first 20 minutes tonight. As you read this, perio must be controlled before placement of implants. It's a must. But what's also important in this study it's a must to continue, I'll say maintenance, and control the periodontal disease after placement. And here's the complexity about this. I'm going to show you this one study that was a 40-year retrospective study later. So now you have periodontally questionable teeth. And we live in a country, sorry to say, that is taking out all these questionable teeth and putting all on fours in, okay. And I get that, it's okay. But what about a patient who wants to save their teeth or they've lost 50% of their bone, the teeth aren't mobile, do, do they really require all on fours each and every time like they're being told? So this the key part of this study is that these patients 
who have these periodontally compromised teeth, okay, they could do damage to future implants based on the periodontal pathogen surrounding them. So you must have a stable dentition, even with a history of periodontal questionable teeth, to allow those implants to survive. And I'm gonna show you cases tonight where that can be. But you gotta get their disease under control. And I'd say this is the other really key one. In, in, in Carusis's study, he found significantly greater probing depths, more implant marginal bone loss, and a higher incidence of peri-implantitis in periodontally compromised patients. So if you know this going in, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm just going to put two implants in here and have the patient come in every three months for 49 tens, and the patient still has 40 bleeding points? No, that is just not acceptable therapy. That's what we did in the 1990s and early 2000s, but not today. And his study showed implant survival was acceptable with patients with the history of perio as long as they were in a maintenance program. So the way I look at this, if a patient had perio in their life or has it ongoing, you got to get it under control and their maintenance program has to be upped. It has to be up versus a patient who has no perio issues and you're putting an implant in number 19 and there's adequate attached gingival tissue and that mouth is healthy. I think routine care may be enough for, the, for that patient. You have to be the one to decide. Healthy patient, no history or history and maybe not so healthy. You're, those are two different categories relating to long-term success. So the question then is, what type of maintenance program? What type? And I'm just going to say this. If we know that half of all implants are going to develop perimucus implant mucositis, perimucositis, what should we be doing prophylactically on those higher risk patients? I'm going to show you tonight. And if we know those patients with periodontal disease are at higher risk for implant failure, why are we not changing our guidelines when we're placing implants? I mean, that's the literature. So this is delivery day. Let's see if this will work. It should. This was a police officer, wonderful guy. And Leonard got bashed with a gun butt in a breaking up a robbery. This was a year long uh, delivery, a year long process. Uh, my periodontist Ralph had to do uh, grafting, significant grafting before we could place the implants. And here's delivery day outside my office. Ask the people walking by. <laughs> so yes, I do like to have fun, but the question on delivery day, is he a healthy patient? Does he have a history of perio? What are we going to do with this patient? Myth number three, maintenance is just brushing, flossing, and rinsing. That may be okay on a single implant and a healthy mouth, two implants and a healthy mouth. But I disagree totally in a patient who has any area of perio and a history of perio. Because going back to Greenstein's study in 97, these organisms are indigenous in the mouth. It's all about the balance and you wanna keep that balance a healthy balance. So I just go back to WebMD. I'm gonna brush, floss and rinse with Listerine. I think there's more to it than that. So what I thought I would do tonight is talk about the tale of two patients. So I'm gonna take all the studies that I've given you because it's how I practice and I'm gonna bring up two patients, two patients. That's all you have to see tonight. And the first is Tracy. The year is 2012. I don't know anything about Perio Protect, by the way. 
He's 62 years old at the time. And he comes in, he's British. He's a piano teacher at the University of Chicago. He wants to save his teeth. And he asked, can I have implants? And he said, cosmetics is not a concern to him. And he said, I'm British. So this is pre-CBCT. And now I don't even take an FMX anymore. My CBCTs have replaced them. I mean, think of it. Equal or less radiation in 7.7 .7 seconds, that's how long it takes. That's like one PA. So this is Tracy's mouth. And he's a 69-year-old smoker. Yep, he's a smoker. Strike one. Long history of periodontal disease and a few restorations. Strike two. He hasn't been to the dentist in three years. Strike three to me. He's got fremitus on four and five and seven and eight. And openly, he has no bite on his left side, as you can see. It's got some minor decay, but he, he wants to save his teeth. Now we're gonna dive a little deeper into this. And I go, where do you start with this kind of guy? And the key question is, does he have what it takes? Because is he going to follow all of my recommendations and suggestions towards his periodontal treatment and long-term maintenance care? And that was the question. Let's just look at a couple areas. Number 30, that was 10 millimeter pocketing. Number eight, had, I don't know, one plus mobility. We've got tremendous bone loss and this is 2012. Now I know what you're all thinking, all on four, all on four, I get it. But he didn't want an all on four. And I listen. And the question is, as you're saying, can you really save teeth? So we're gonna, this is now nine years later, I'm gonna show you where we're at. I'm just gonna show you how we got there. So when he came in and we probed him, all those bees, are blood. So he had some mobility on a few teeth, but basically if he was on Coumadin, he could have bled to death. He just had tremendous periodontal disease. So you already know the bugs are not gonna be good bugs in his mouth. This was his smile, uh, severe overbite, generalized recession. And again, you could be thinking all on four. So what do we do? We do a full exam, obviously. We probe them. We take diagnostic casts. Today, they're, they're digital casts. We talk about his oral hygiene. We got to talk about his oral hygiene. And what's he going to do to up his oral hygiene? We DNA cultured him. And we got to DNA culture him. I got to know what the bugs are. And DNA culturing is so simple today. It was simple back then. It's a spit test. And we wanted to understand his expectations and desires. And he said, I want to save my teeth and I want implants. I don't want false teeth. And so I said, okay. So here's his first DNA test. And he had AA, which is the most aggressive bug tissue invasive. He had lower levels of two of the red complex here, I'll show you. And he had two of the orange complex, EN and FN over the MIH level. But basically, he had the presence of AATF, TD, EN, FN, CR, and PM. So he had these bugs, and we had to get these bugs under control. Now, whether you're an antibiotic user or not, let me just clearly say, one of the best things about DNA testing is it'll come up with which antibiotic you want to use versus guessing. And with these bugs, it came out to be amoxicillin 500 and metronidazole. So it was a double combination. Now, I'm not going politics of antibiotics, but back in the day, that's exactly what we did. Have a great night, Dan. Um, that's what we did. It was our traditional way of approaching it. So when you send out the DNA, when you culture the DNA and send it out, his description was bleeding on probing, Swelling, bone loss, redness. Yeah, he had bad breath. Generalized issues. 
I call this advanced periodontitis, not necessarily refractory. Again, different bugs in refractory versus advanced. He's a smoker and cardiovascular disease. And you're all going, this guy, this is going to be the worst case. Well, that's what I want to show you. Two bad cases. This was his occlusion. So I had to keep adjusting the occlusion. You can't treat perio with mobile teeth. So again, night guards working in protrusive, left working and right working. So this is how we basically were doing our cases back in 2012. In blue, potential DNA, we did it. We didn't do genetic or saliva testing. We did an occlusal evaluation, a restorative evaluation. He had no sensitivity. His first therapy back in the day was full mouth debridement with laser decontamination. And we are a, a huge laser office. I can't tell you how important lasers are. My hygienists were all diode certified. The, you know, there's a Gemini from Ultradent in every operatory. And now the next stages will be going and really learning Lenop and many other things and working with NDAGs and working even in the laser world that way. But back then, decontamination setting occlusal adjustment. Okay. Now, the second and third visits would be half mouth debridement with lasers. And that's when we would give the systemic antibiotics. Now, I want to make a point here. You never put the patient on the antibiotic until the biofilm is removed. So you want to stage the second and third therapies within a week apart. Ideal therapy back in the day was one full mouth debridement, put them on systemic antibiotics because you've broken up the biofilm. You never, ever, ever put them on antibiotics before scaling and planning. It won't do anything, won't penetrate. Back in the day, we still do this. If there were eight nines, we would go back into those areas and re-debride them one more time because you ask a hygienist, can you really get into an eight millimeter pocket and get it clean every time? The answer is no. So our hygienist, and they're all so skilled at this, they'll go back into those seven, eights, and nines and re-debride them a second time. Then we'll bring them back and evaluate them. We never probe for three to six months, no probing. And as we completed him, we took out tooth number 30. And it, there was limited finances, by the way. It wasn't like Tracy just said, Here, here's a hundred grand. He was limited, but wanted implants. And we'll show you what we ended up doing. So we did some osseous surgery after we had his perio initially under control. His final restorative was two implants in the upper. And yeah, two implants and we made him a lower partial to replace the missing teeth. Ongoing, he had supportive periodontal therapy, comes in every three months. And he started Perio Protect somewhere around circa 2015 when I got trained. And we just took new impressions on him recently for replacement trays. So early 2014, if you look, his bleeding on probing was much better, but those are still 25 bleeding points. So we had done everything, done the surgery, placed the implants, and yet we still had 25 bleeding points. I was not happy. And he's happy. He's got his teeth and his partial. Could we do more? And it goes back to history of perio. Could we do more? So there I was in a course listening to Dwayne on Perio Protect. Met Tanya. Loved the family. Sorry, gang. Loved the family. Watched how he was treating periodontal long-term patients. And I immediately knew this was what Tracy needed. Perio Protect is fully complementary to your scaling and planing and lasers. It doesn't replace it. You still need to get the plaque, the tartar. You've got to get all that done. But Perio Protect is all about long-term maintenance. The key ingredient is hydrogen peroxide. It's a 1.7%, very low sensitivity in my career. And I've done over 400 patients. What is it? It's a wound cleanser. It's an oral debriding agent. It will actually debride the cell wall matrix. It will put oxygen in the pocket. So what happens? You have, you put hydrogen peroxide in, 
And what does it break down into? Oxygen and water. And what do anaerobic bacteria hate? They hate oxygen. So this is a natural byproduct of the body. So there are no allergic reactions. Studies by Marshall showed no cancerous outcomes. And you don't develop a bacterial resistance versus putting in versus patients taking antibiotics. So I'm gonna highlight three things about oxygen therapy. Oxygen induces neurovascularization. You've heard of hyperbaric oxygen. Well, that's what oxygen does. So after you do your therapy, think about the revascularization and working with lasers, it's a one-two combination. And when you have new granulation tissue coming into place after your laser and scaling and planing, you get better vascularization and the tissue is stronger. And lastly, oxygen is kind of the key to really I, I springboarding neutrophils and uh, the key to phagocytosis. Those are three key points about oxygen. And that's really what we're talking about with hydrogen peroxide and perio protect. So they did a study and I, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. This will be my, I think my last study. And this is almost 10 years ago. How does it relate to bleeding on probing, whether with initial therapy, before initial therapy or after initial therapy? And really they studied bleeding both in shallow pockets and deeper pockets. And I term shallow pockets less than three millimeters. They termed it, it's very important, less than five millimeters. So when I'm gonna show you these things, understand shallow pockets were four and five millimeters. So where you see the icon and the uh, line going up at weeks of treatment, three weeks of treatment, you will see in shallow pockets with perio protecting scaling and planing, with, with shallow pockets, you get a decrease in bleeding with both traditional therapy and perio protect. But right afterwards, or about week five, you can start to see bleeding on probing coming back in these patients with shallow pockets. So again, brushing, flossing, not doing the trick, Perio Protect keeping it down at 8% or 50% less. Look at the deeper pockets. The deeper pockets, okay, with the Perio Protect starting at 30% of the pockets had bleeding, okay? 29% went down to 8%. Now this is deeper pockets. Whereas if you look at uh, deep pockets with traditional brushing, flossing, you're still dealing with after therapy going up to 29% with bleeding on probing. And that's what was Tracy's situation. He was doing everything he could with his history. He was just gonna bounce back because brushing and flossing just wasn't enough. And so in summary, you get far greater reduction no matter what when you have four and five millimeter pockets versus it, you just get far greater reduction versus seven and eight millimeter pockets. But still in seven and eight millimeter pockets, the reduction in bleeding with Perio Protect is huge. And I'm gonna show you that in Tracy's case. So our protocols are a little different today. So I'm just gonna to go to our protocols today. Okay, we do the DNA testing. We still adjust his bite. We still do a full mouth debridement. We still do all that. We take impressions for Perio Protect after the first visit. Now, when I say after, after all the super gingival tartar has been removed, I want the trays to fit tight. So he then gets the tray. Our patients now get the trays. And in his case, he would have had the Perio Protect, Perio Protect trays. He would have worn them twice a day for two weeks for two weeks. Then after wearing them for two weeks, he now comes in for his half mouth debridement, just like we did before with lasers, maybe antibiotics, depends. Got to see the situation clinically. He keeps wearing the trays twice a day during therapy. If he had to come back for additional therapy, week later, two weeks later, he's still wearing the trays twice a day. After therapy, he can stay at twice a day, 
but routinely we move them to once a day and tray wearing's 10 or 15 minutes. And routinely we bring them down to once a day when we're evaluating them. If we see things are progressing well, you know what, Tracy, if you want to, you can only, you only have to do it once a day. They love that. Bleaching. Yep, your teeth will bleach from this. There's no doubt about it. It's 1.7% hydrogen peroxide. My mistake, I didn't know. He was one of my early cases. So the implants, they're dark because he had dark teeth. You can see one implant there and one implant there. That was his original color. This is 2015, 16, after he's been on it for six months or a year. No bleeding on probing. Pockets are two to three millimeters. You heard me, two to three millimeters. He's still getting some staining from smoking. He's a smoker and he's not bleeding on probing. So now we're seven years later when I took these. How important is it? Actually, nine years later, since I saw him, how important is tooth number 31? How about tooth number eight? You thought we, it was one plus mobile, now has no mobility. His CBCT recently showing you the furcation on 31, holding. Look at the bone level on number eight. Look how little bone he has, no mobility. If you protect these people, guide them, and they come in, minor occlusal adjustments, these teeth can last forever. I'm not going to say forever. I shouldn't say that. They can last a long time. And that's what we're looking for, a long time. These are his trays at recall. Patients bring in their trays every time to make sure they're fitting. Sometimes we do remake trays. They just don't fit as snug as they once did. And so when he comes in, we're cleaning his trays and his partial. I mean, this is his last visit. Those are his gums. I mean, this is what we're seeing with Perio Protect. This is his lower. So when I talk about survivability of compromised teeth, in 1993 was the classic low study. It went back 40 years. Almost, it was 166 patients, 455 questionable teeth, and therapy then, there was no burial protect. It was just debridement, oral hygiene instructions. You know, they did full flap keratage. They did flap keratage and recall. So they treated them. There were only 55 teeth lost over those 40 years. 55 teeth only out of the 455. Second molars, upper first molars, those were one and two. So they made the most, that, those were one and two. Lower second molars were third. Periodontal abscesses were the primary reason, but the conclusion was, and I wanna tell everybody this, teeth are considered that if you have teeth that you're considering a questionable prognosis on, if you can get them stable and healthy, I, I'm just telling you and have great supportive treatment, you're, you're going to just see these, these teeth can last. So Tracy, he's the tail part one. He was very, very successful because we controlled his disease before we put the implants in and we controlled the disease afterwards. And PerioProtect was key. Five or, five or six years. Five or six years. And let me ask you, initially when they were prescribed, and what did you notice? As well, within in the first maybe four or five months, I, I noticed a, a marked change in the coloration. Oh. It, got the, it was a definite a, a yellow, you know, off, off white. At least uh, you know, six months, I noticed a change. And okay, you know, the color change. Tell me about your gums. And the gums, I also noticed a change within the first six, seven months. Uh, less bleeding. They, they just seem pinker, healthier, not, a, not as sensitive. You know, when, I'm, when I would come in, it would be very sensitive. And when we started the treatment, there was a lot of 
don't work a lot of treatment going on. A lot of treatment. And the fact is, I think only about one, two, but all the years since we started. Since we started, yeah. Amazing. Okay. Um, so do you feel overall that this is something that really is a part of your daily hygiene? Yeah, at, at first, at first, for the first year or so, I would I did it twice, twice, twice in a twenty-four right. hour period. Morning. Now I just do in the evening for about 15, 15, 15 minutes, right, right before I go to bed, and I, I set the alarm so I don't you know, cheat it and <laughs> cheat the time, and uh, the alarm goes off. That's it. So it's it's no problem. Okay, so we just inserted some new trays in here, and you know that they even. Correct. Yeah, I don't know if the ones I had before they got misplaced and lost, whether they had somehow stretched a little bit. I felt like they had just sort of these have a nice snug, a nice snug. Right. So after a number of years, it becomes getting better. These they actually do fit better. They they they, they, they are a better fit, my friend. Yeah. And the fit becomes key because that's why they have to bring them in every recall visit. Because if it's snug, it's going to hold that peroxide in. And as you can see, where it says the gasket seal, it's how Periprotect makes these trays. There's a seal. Don't think you're going to make these in your office. They're specifically scored by the way you send your periodontal notes in. And it's this gasket seal, to me, is the key ingredient of what holds the peroxide in, in, around and inside the pockets. The second patient or part two of the tale of two patients, is everything I did wrong. So I met him 15 years ago. He was referred to me, he was 52 at the time, very healthy. He had tremendous bone loss and his home care was horrendous, horrendous. That was the Panorex forwarded to me. And this is from 2003 is Panorex some assorted bite wing circa 2003. God, that seems like 3000 years ago when I look at those bite wings like that. So in 2005, his dentist told him, you gotta have all your teeth out and he declined. And in 2006, he presented to my office. I'm gonna talk a little faster so I can get through this. His initial care, was I followed the traditional approach. We worked him up, and I'm going to show you this, traditional therapy, and he loved his hygienist at the periodontist office, so we worked with her. She did not do lasers, um, but we worked with her. So when I go back and look at his chart, we saw him in 06 for full mouth debridement. He goes back to his hygienist for scaling and planing, and then we took out a couple of upper left teeth and did osseous surgery. Now, this is all in 06. In 07, just five months later, we placed implants in 14 and 15. Okay. You saw his perio. You saw what was going on. I told you his hygiene was terrible. What were we thinking? What were we thinking? So, poor hygiene, aggressive perio history. This is two years later. Look at, look at those implants. Totally predictable. We did a DNA test. Look at his DNA test. I mean, this guy's got perio ongoing, multiple pathogens in his mouth. So failure was an absolute. So I am showing you failure. I, I know it's failure, but you, you can't, if, if a dentist says he's never had failure, I don't think he's ever been a dentist. So we never got his perio under control, never. And he was coming in all the time for his 4910s. And I'm going to tell you, that's not maintenance. And I'm telling you, how can four hours of therapy for 365 days be maintenance? It just can't be. And his hygiene was terrible. I mean, once a day brushing, it's ridiculous. Should never have placed the implants. But look at this. Every three months, this guy came in for his hygiene visits. Laser supportive therapy. Well, let me tell you something. Laser supportive therapy on someone who's got poor home care isn't going to do anything, especially with aggressive peri. I'm just, that's just how I feel. So 
So we go back to the study by Zerani. Perio disease should be controlled before placement, and it's imperative to control it after we fail. So we didn't control it before, and I know we didn't control it after. And he just continued not to listen to our recommendations, visit after visit. And through 2017, he failed, and I took another test on him. And look at that. His, he's getting worse. So he's coming in, and I'm showing you he's getting worse. And then the aha moment. He bought a power toothbrush, and we started Perio Protect. The code is 5994. Another occlusal adjustment. Bought an air flosser, eh, liked it, but he bought more Perio Gel. And that's how you know they're using it when they're coming into the office and buying it. Well, this is how these are the impressions we took on Itero, and you have to capture all the tissue. You must capture the tissue. I mean, I've seen so many bad digital impressions from Perio Protect. You must capture the tissue if the tray is going to fit. That's the fit. The fit's got to hug those implants and those teeth. It's got to fit. So two years later, versus taking his FMX, I take CBCTs, of course. His turnaround's been unbelievable. So here's his CBCT, and I'm showing you this. Look at his bone loss, and you go, Lou, there's no bone. I know there's no bone. He didn't want to lose his teeth. He had that aha moment. I know we've lost half those implants. I mean, I have the bone around those implants and my surgeon and I, when we flapped it, I smoothed all, all. Uh, I'd smoothed literally anything coronal of the bone. I just wanted everything smooth when we reattached them. So he comes in religiously, mild occlusal adjustments every year, and he's an AM PerioProtect user. I wish he would do it twice a day, but you see the results. He's really doing great. Here he is. Tell me, what do you do in the morning? Tell me your ritual and then the evening. Well, the first thing Look at me. I do after I get up is to use a pair of gel. Okay. Uh, Period. For my whole life. Take it, uh, take it. And he's going to go on and on about it. Okay. I'm going to show you how stable these teeth are. You saw all the bone loss. Tissue, tissue, tissue. How do we not do this for our patients? The key is upping their home care for these risk patients. History of perio, perio maintenance. You know they are. My rule of thumb is if you're probing and you've got 10 bleeding points, they need trays. Lastly, I'm just going to close on this. We all know the power of brushing and flossing. One of the biggest issues with power brushes is you don't know if they're replacing their power brush heads. Just going to show you a concept most of you haven't seen yet. The subscription model of Burst and Quip, patients may not be coming in, getting their teeth clean, but they're getting brush heads. That really doesn't help me. I want to see them. So the key question is what's going in the goodie bag? And most of the time, my power brushers are not getting power brushes, brush replacements in the goodie bag. So Catapult evaluated a product called Zana. Zana has a very unique concept. You get personalized brushes with your office names. But more importantly, here's the concept is you go right to the bottom. What you do is you're paying, I don't know, 25, 30, 40 dollars a month, and you get literally an unlimited amount of brush heads. So the patients, they buy a toothbrush for $99 through Zana, and every time they come in, they're getting new brush heads. So that's what's going in the goodie bag because they're costing me literally 50 cents or less. So that's my giveaway because that's the same cost as a manual brush. Again, just saying a different concept out there. So what goes in the goodie bag in my office? The specific plaque seeker tip from Waterpick, the brush heads from Zana right now, 
and perio gel. Those are key for these patients. I don't even have time. You can just find Zana on the web. So tonight, I just wanted to share with you the importance of treating perio prior to implant placement and equally customizing their home care. So the next time your patient walks, the next new patient comes in and they've got an implant issue like this, you can come up with a customized plan on how to treat these patients. Because let me tell you, fake news is that implants are 98% successful. Talked about that already tonight. I'm gonna answer some questions because I like you work today and I don't wanna keep all of you. So the first question is, what is your opinion of mini implants as a treatment? I can just say, uh, Angela, we no longer offer them in my practice. Um, we have done a few mini implants as temporary, temporary bridges. So if we're doing serial extractions or a big fix case, and I can use some minis to hold temporary bridges in place, I'm really comfortable with that. Next question. Uh, and I'm reading these, so I'm not deciphering. Uh, I had a patient that had recession but couldn't wear perio protect trays due to the being sensitive using it. What do you recommend? So SDI and other companies who do bleaching, um, they offer like SDI offers Soothe. So what I would do is I would fill Sandra the tray with Soothe, and I would, and that would be pretty much your number one way. So. Bleaching companies make desensitizers that are gels. And, and if you don't wanna go that route, then openly you can use an MI paste every day. And the MI paste itself is a desensitizer and so are many of the Stannis fluorides out there. They don't stain anymore. But routinely, if they've got trays, and we've had a few patients, we use SDI's Soothe. And that would be my recommendation. Um, Ultranet makes a great product that's eluding me right now, but they, if you're using Ultranet products, they also use a soothing type product, a desensitizing. Can you use Perio Protect on all on fours? And the answer is yes. You can use them on all on fours. Now, fit, you'd have to really call the company. We do use this on patients. And listen, there is a lot of things about all on fours. If patients had aggressive Perio, and all their teeth are out, and you think all those bacteria are gone. Nope, they're in the tonsillar crypts and everything. So these patients are prone. So the answer is yes. Last question. I was told that when probing implants, the most important reading is the center, central reading, skipping mesial and distal, is that correct? Well, I'll be honest with you. I look at the radiographs. I don't know if that's correct or incorrect because I'm looking at the radiographs and basically I will probe and it's usually kind of, you know, obviously it's a plastic probe, but we'll walk the probe through there and I will look distally, mesially and central. Now, on a quick check, we're always going central. That's what I can tell you right in the middle. Uh, thank you for that question, Dina. Um, another one, what is your experience with patients using this peroxide product in light of changing of the oral micro microbe and possible ingestion of peroxide on a regular basis. Okay, now I'm gonna say this, and I know you're anonymous. Um, you teach patients how to use this and how to place this. If they place too much in a tray, they're gonna be spitting it out. I hear you, just like bleaching. And it's all about proper placement and placing it in the trays and not overfilling the trays. So am I overly concerned about the ingestion of peroxide on a regular basis? No, we're talking 10 or 15 minutes of therapy. Usually the patients wear them in the shower. And so no, I'm really not overly concerned. In all my years using this, I haven't seen that to be an issue. And that's it. So let me just say, thank you so, so much uh, for uh, your time and attention. And I'll see you again in the near future. Thank you, everybody.